Good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 22, but we're going to spend most of our time in Luke chapter 7. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles or your biblical devices to Luke chapter 7. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here and really encouraged and and excited for the word that the Lord has placed in my heart for us for the next few weeks. Love God, love people, make disciples. Say it with me. Love God. (laughs) You got in front of me. Love God, love people, make disciples. So the last time I spoke to you, I spoke out of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, let us tear off, let us strip off, depending on what translation you're reading. Let us get rid of the things that might be slowing us down, especially the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run the race with endurance so that we might receive the prize that Jesus has for us. Weight is, weight is an interesting thing. A few years back, I was diagnosed with AFib, and so I tweaked my diet and lost quite a bit of weight, only to, if you haven't noticed lately, gain it back, now that everything's great with the heart. But I've gained it back a little bit more than I thought I would, and so I've realized it has slowed me down just a bit. I call it my winter weight. Along with my winter beard, I'm putting on winter weight. But I've noticed it has slowed me down just a little bit, especially if I'm bending over or doing some physical activities, which, let's be honest, that doesn't happen often for me. But it made me think about the weight that gets put on us, and, and I don't, please, hear, please don't hear me wrong on this, but I think all of us that have grown up in the church, like you were born into the church, maybe not just Bayshore Church, but the church. Throughout the years, the enemy has put some religious weight on you, whether you like it or not, because we have some man-made systems, some man-made ideas, some man-made expressions for doing church. No matter how hard I try as a pastor, no matter how hard we try as a leadership team, there are simply systems that we have allowed or we have placed on not necessarily even bad things. But there is some weight on us that I think and I believe slows us down as a body. Coming out of that message, I had spent the week prior to it examining myself, taking a spiritual checkup and looking for the baggage or the weight that might be slowing me down. I spoke that message to you a couple weeks back and I'm standing in the back helping to get the camera torn down and the Lord just says, what about the weight that might be slowing the body of Bay Shore down? What is that weight? What is keeping us from loving God, loving people, and making disciples? Because if it gets all stripped back, church, that's it. Great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is our purpose or our vision, that is what God, that is what Jesus answered and said, what is the greatest commandment, what does he desire his people to do? Love him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Love his people, his children, as you would yourself. We'll talk about that next week. And then simply as he begins his ascension, right as he begins, or right at the very end of his time here on earth, he gives us our mission Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of Jesus and teaching them to obey my commandments. So we have our purpose and we have our mission. Purpose is to love God, love people. Mission is to make disciples. Love God, love people, make disciples. And it's interesting the way that things lined up without me even or or the way that the schedule lined up and the way that Noah and Heather's time lined up. Next week, next week, I I, I want to bless a group of you who the Lord lays on your heart this week to go out and share the gospel as we're here. And then the final week, ironically, that I preach on making disciples, you will hear testimonies from that team that went out to do just that physically. 
So it'll be an interesting couple weeks. So next week, 9 o'clock, be here. In fact, close your eyes with me and pray with me this morning. I want to commission you. Father, I know that there is those in the room that struggle with the sharing of the gospel. They struggle with evangelism. And so I pray, Father God, that this would be the week that you burden them, burden their hearts to be here, to be trained and equipped to do just that. May they listen and be obedient to your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that prayer doesn't mean the entire room goes. Now, if you want to, that would be incredible. I'm not going to stop you. I'll preach to an empty room or maybe just go with you. I don't know. But I think, I believe as I've been praying, if you're struggling with evangelism, you're struggling with sharing Jesus Christ, this is like jumping, like, this is like a shock to the system. And it's an incredible tool that can be you can be given and an, and an incredible equipping that you can be given. So 9 o'clock here, teams will, will anoint you, commission you to go, and you will go. Um, and then the following week, we will hear your testimonies, and we will talk about making disciples and the power that the Lord released in us to do just that. Amen? Somebody excited? You excited? All right. So... In Luke, or I'm sorry, backing up, Matthew 22, it says, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. So Jesus had been in this conversation with the Sadducees, and the Pharisees saw that he had silenced them. So the Pharisees meet together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord. Love is agapio. The word agapio there, it's the verb for agape. Agape is the noun. The verb or the action is agapio. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So what does it mean to love God? If we're to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, what does that mean? And then how much love is required? I had a conversation with a close friend this a couple weeks ago as he was, as we were talking about the love of God and loving God. I think we have to be careful to put up benchmarks or, or mile markers on, okay, you don't love God unless you reach this mile marker. You don't love God unless you've attended this event. You don't love God unless you go to church. And those are all things that love should motivate you to do, but not condemn you for not doing, in a sense. And so this is kind of a tough question. If you really think about it, do you love God? Peter got asked this question in John chapter 21. After he had denied Jesus three times, Jesus has, has come back to life and he's hanging out with the disciples and he takes some time with Peter and he says, Jesus, do you, or Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, you know I love you. He says, then feed my sheep. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. And he says, then take care of my flock. Third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's exasperated at this point. I think we would be too. If Jesus was here this morning and he asked us that question, he sat down with you specifically and said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I think at some point, if, we, if our answer is yes, if our answer is yes, we get exasperated like Peter. He's like, Lord, you know that I love you. I've given up my life for you. I feel bad for denying you. And then Jesus goes in, he says, okay, Peter, if you love me, then this is what your life is going to look like. This is what's going to happen because of your love for me. And it wasn't a pretty picture, if you remember the story. So don't think this morning that we're any different or any better or in any other position, uh, better position than Peter was. Do you love Jesus? If the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your strength, all your might, do you love Jesus? John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, 
obey my commands. And if you do this, if you do this, then I will send the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is dependent upon your love for me. So there's, there, there is a bit of a dependency here. And notice, we're noticing the word command is being used. So is it true love if you're commanded to love someone? Is it true love for Jesus to look at me, me or look at you and say, Andy, I demand or I command that you love me. If you want to follow me, you have to love me. And here's the reason that I believe that Jesus sets it up this way. Because you've heard me say this over the past few weeks. Love, I believe, is the greatest motivator that we have. It's why it's so important. It's why Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are so concerned with you loving something more than him. Because if love is the greatest motivator, and all of us who have fallen in love, you know what I'm talking about. We fall, those of you that maybe have fallen in love at some point in time in your life with the wrong person, you know what I'm talking about. It motivates you. Love is a motivator. So Jesus is saying, listen, I know that love is the greatest motivator, and the only way that you can get to the Father is if you love me. Because in the New Testament, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way to the Father. If you love the Father, you have to love me because I'm the doorway. I'm the gate. I'm your entry button. And in order to love, if you love the Father, then you would love me. And the Pharisees couldn't handle it. They couldn't understand it. And they walked away jealously because they wanted the love that the people were giving to Jesus. Matthew 10, verse 37 and 39, Jesus says this. Listen to this very carefully. And with this verse, you understand the motivation, or you understand the fact that love is the great motivator. Write that in your notes. Love is the great motivator. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Jumping to Luke chapter 7, we'll go back to that in a moment. There's an incredible story. I think we have to dive deep into the motivation of the woman that we're about to examine. Because love is what motivated her to step out of every traditional, cultural, social boundary that a woman could do at this time simply to worship Jesus. And it's important that love motivated her to do that in this moment. Luke chapter 7, verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain sinful or immoral woman from that city, many believe that this was Mary Magdalene, um, I would tend to agree just a bit, but I'm not going to put my, I'm not going to stake my reputation on that claim. You guys can study that for yourself. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she bought or she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. And then she continued and kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know. If this man were a prophet, he would know what's touching him. He would know what's wiping her hair on his feet. He would know who's kissing him. He's thinking this. He's not saying it out loud. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. It's probably one of the most despicable things. As I read a commentary on this, he used a phrase that would have been the most despicable thing a human being could say about another human being. That caught me. He was so enraged and so disgusted by her. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. 
Simon goes, go ahead, teacher. And the terminology here is he said it snidely. He said it with disdain. Go ahead, teacher. You got this sinful lady all over you, and you're going to tell me? You're going to teach me? Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more? Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. Has your debt been canceled this morning? Has your debt been canceled this morning? That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman. I like the fact that he turned his back. I, I think he, he's like, I'm done with you, Simon. I'm done. I can't, I, I can't, I'm not even going to deal with you. Like that, that spirit, get it away from me. And he turns, and I picture in, in my mind of what's going on, he just kind of is like, we're done. You want to think that way? You want to be that way? We're done. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, actually he didn't, he wasn't finished with her, sorry, my mistake. This woman kneeling here when I entered your home, you didn't offer me water. Again, I think he's turned away from her and he's, he's actually more implying to her. When I entered ho- your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you this, her sins, they're many. And this, in this terminology, he's like, listen, I know. You don't have to tell me. Like, I know what she's done. I know where she's been. I know the person. I was there when she was created. She was created through me. Don't you tell me who she is. Let me tell you who she is. I love that. Somebody needs to hear this. Somebody in the room, you need to hear this because you've been dealing with this mentally. And you've been, allowed the, you've been allowing the world to tell you who you are. And this morning, Jesus said, I want to tell you who you are. You are loved. See, this whole love thing, the way that it works is we love because Jesus first loved us. We're going to talk about that next week, 1 John chapter 4. We love because he first loved us. And see, the Pharisee pointed his finger at this woman and said, this is who she is. And the world has been pointing its finger at you saying, this is who you are. And you know what Jesus was saying? I'm, we're done with that. Jesus would say to you this morning, we're done with that. I'm going to tell you who you are. Listen to what he says to this woman. Remember, she was deemed as despicable, deplorable in our culture. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus says to us today, your sins are forgiven. I would encourage you to let Jesus define who you are. Don't let the world define who you are. Don't let the past define who you are. Don't let shame define who you are. You are forgiven. Look at your neighbor and just simply say, forgiven. And say it with confidence. Forgiven. Nobody got, I'm forgiven. You are forgiven, church. Your debts are canceled because of the love of Jesus. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? This is what got Jesus crucified. And Jesus said to the woman, and Jesus would say to us this morning, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So as we look at this quickly, what is love? Again, the question is, how much do I need to love? How much do I need to express? This is a pretty drastic expression of love. This is a pretty huge offering 
of love that this woman brings. Not only, like a lot of times we, we want to focus on the, the jar of perfume, but I want to focus on the, the cultural boundaries that she broke through. She shouldn't have been anywhere near, anywhere near the Pharisees and the Sadducees. She was unclean. She was filled with sin. She was despicable. You don't want any of that to rub off on you. The fact that she's even out and about at this time of day was a cultural hurdle that she needed to jump over to get to Jesus. Matthew Henry says this, we will love God to the degree that we recognize the magnitude of our sins and the immensity of God's grace to forgive them. Read that to yourself for a moment. We will love God to the, degree, to the degree that we recognize the magnitude of sins of our sins and the immensity of God's grace to forgive them. You swim in an ocean of grace. So I believe that love is simply to value, simply to put or place value. We place value on things in a lot of different categories and a lot of different areas. Paul is talking to the Philippians. He's writing this letter to the Philippians, and he talks about his pedigree. In Philippians chapter 3, he's kind of gone through, this is my pedigree as a Jewish Pharisee. This is who I was. I was circumcised. I, I, I was taught the strictest of commands and laws. I know them inside and out. And this is Paul stripping off the weight that slows him down. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, listen to this carefully, for his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. And that word, you've heard it talked about, it's a very intense word for garbage so that I could gain Christ. I once thought these things were valuable. I wonder if there's things that we believe are valuable to our walk with Christ that are actually slowing us down. I wonder if there's systems or strategies or mindsets in our culture today that we think are valuable to the sake of Christ. This is what I believe the Lord is doing. Love God, love people, make disciples. You strip it all back to that. Say we strip it all back to that and we begin again. And everything that we do as a church is built on those three principles and that purpose and that mission. So we build something in, it's gotta love God. It's gotta express its love for God. It's gotta be worshipful to God. It's gotta be about God and how much we love him. And we build a new system that is all about people, loving people, loving people more than we love ourselves. And then our mission is to make disciples. And so that our teaching and our equipping, and I hate using the word systems because we become so systematic in our culture. I once thought these things were valuable. He's talking about the old school way. He's talking about his, the teaching of law, of the law. He's talking about his circumcision. He's talking about everything that was important to him before Jesus came. I once thought all these things were valuable. So individually, I wonder if you absolutely allowed the Holy Spirit to do some, you allowed him to, to begin to speak and begin to take inventory of what you think and believe is valuable within the church and within your walk with Christ, are there things slowing you down? Finally, I believe that to love God is to treasure him. Okay, so value and treasure may seem like they're the same. I don't necessarily believe that they are. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives... The parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. I think 
I think there are things we need to value in order to grow in Christ. We need to value learning and reading and praying and worshiping, attending a church that values what the three things more than anything what I just shared. I think there's value in that. What I think it means to treasure God is you're going to treasure him the way that you think, the way that you feel, it's not circumstantial. Your trust in God, your love for God doesn't change, even when your circumstances and your situations don't. If love is a motivator, and our love for the Lord isn't at the degree of treasuring, see, I think the, the woman who was forgiven much, who came in, she treasured the fact that she now, she's now, she's no longer despicable. She's no longer seen as this woman that shouldn't be out in public. She has an inner healing of grace and love inside of her, and she's going to treasure that for the rest of her life. So let's think of this. Matthew Henry also said, there's no such thing as small sin because there's no such thing as a small God to sin against. So no matter the weight or the degree of your sin, it's still sin. So for the person that was born into the church and has always been a part of the church, your sin was just as great as the men that we saw standing up here last Sunday giving testimony. Because we've talked about this. What is evil? Anything apart from God or anything lacking or empty of God is evil. So until you come to a place of accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and treasuring him and loving him with all of your heart, soul, and mind, until you come to that decision, your, your, your sin is just as weighty as what we saw last week or what mine was and what I was saved from. And what scares me a bit, because you look at this story that Jesus gives to the Pharisees, and he asks, who do you think loves me more? And he, the Pharisees' simple answer is, well, the one who, obviously the one who was forgiven more. But in Matthew Henry's commentary, if we're not careful, we weight sin differently. And yes, there is sin that like, is more deplorable in our eyes, but sin is sin. And you swim in the same pool, in the same ocean of grace as, let me put it very, very bluntly, a murderer who's now sitting on death row that was preached the gospel to and accepted Jesus Christ. You will run the streets of heaven with them. I, I, I always love when loving hands is here with us because the excitement and the joy in those men because they understand evil. I've talked about this a little bit in our, in our connection and partnership with RUN, that the pastors there ran in such an evil thread and understand evil to a degree that we probably never will understand it because the evil around us, yes, there's some blatant evil around us, but what if the evil around you is just simply to distract you from loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? What if the evil around you is just to put on some extra weight to get you to focus more so on what I would call the organization of church instead of the organism of church? And what I mean by that is, I believe if we're not careful, we love church and the system and the way it's done more so than we love God. That's the organization of church rather than the organism, the living, breathing bride of Christ. So, as we close, worship team, you can come on back up. What is love? What is love? And how much do I need to love? How do I value and how do I treasure? And if you would stand as the worship team comes, I'm going to ask you... I believe that love is a verb as well as a noun, correct? No? Yes? Okay. Checking with my educator back here. 
we see a, an, a tremendous act or expression of love out of this woman. And she was the one that was forgiven. We see a demeaning, judgmental attitude out of the Pharisee. And he was the one that Jesus dismissed. This morning, close your eyes for me. What have you offered Jesus? This morning, what have you offered Jesus? What have you brought to the feet of Jesus? This morning, have you brought water to wash his feet? Have you brought tears? This morning, did you come ready to greet him with a kiss? olive oil to anoint his head. What is your offering to Jesus this morning in this moment? Because the degree of your love I believe determines the amount of expression you're about to be willing to give. Hebrews 13, 15, therefore Jesus, or through Jesus, therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Has the Lord seemed distant lately? Has his voice been unclear? Have you struggled with anger, struggled with complaining, grumbling? Has life just not been hunky-dory? I would say this morning, offer up a sacrifice of praise to the one who loved you first. Because out of that love comes the sea of grace and the sea of mercy. And when we come to a deeper understanding of the grace and the mercy and the love that the Lord has for us, it motivates us. It's no longer a command. It's no longer a command. Because the love for, your love for the Lord motivates you to love people. Your love for the Lord motivates you to make disciples. Your love for the Lord motivates you to love your wife. Your love for the Lord motivates you to be a loving father. Your love for the Lord motivates you to be the best, most joyful business owner or the best, most joyful employee. Your love for the Lord, your understanding of the sea and the mercy and the grace that you swim in. See, that's what, that's what the woman... Was, that's where the woman was coming from. She was coming from there. She was coming from that sea of grace and sea of mercy, that sea of understanding of she was dead in Christ. She was dead in her sin. She was filthy before she met Jesus. And this guy came along, this man came along with the most loving eyes, the most tender touch, and the most loving voice she had ever heard. And when he touched her and he, when he healed her spirit, she was swimming in this ocean that she had never swam in before. And she was wet with God's mercy. She was wet with his grace. And she couldn't help herself. And she broke down and broke through every cultural barrier she could get to show her love for Jesus. So do you love Jesus, church? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Then let's offer him a sacrifice of praise this morning. I don't care what song we sing next. Get over it. Offer a sacrifice of praise. That might be your sacrifice. Let's strip off everything that slows us down. Everything that slows us down. See, the Lord has to reveal that. You have to allow him to reveal that. 
So as we offer him up a sacrifice of praise, he opens his arms to you and they get wider and you can go running into those arms. That's why I love praise and worship so much. Let's offer up a sacrifice of praise that with lips that are willing to profess Jesus. Amen, church? Let's give him some praise this morning.